Hello and welcome to Journal, I'm Steve Kendall. Ohioans went to the polls in early March in the presidential primary, and there were some interesting results. What does that mean for Ohio moving forward as you look at the general election in November? Well, we're joined by our expert panel of David Jackson, professor at the Bowling Green Department of Political Science, also associate professor Nicole Califf Hughes from that same department, and the host of the State of Ohio in Columbus to give us that version of what's going on in Columbus, uh, Karen Kastler. Thank you all for being here again today. Uh, Karen, before we get into what happened, uh, in March, uh, some the story just broke within the last 48 hours so as we were getting ready to record this, that now there's a question about whether or not Joe Biden will be on the ballot in November because of the date of the Democratic National Convention. So talk about that and some of the past history where that has happened before in the state where the dates don't match up with that 90 day deadline to be on the to basically file your candidacy to be on the November ballot. Well, the 90-day deadline was changed from, I think, a 70, 75-day deadline in 2010. And since 2010, when that 90-day deadline became the law, there have been two times that there have been problems with the national nominating conventions. There was a problem in 2012, and there was a problem in 2020. And both of those times, both of the nominated conventions were affected. They were going to be held after the deadline to be certified for the Ohio ballot. So state lawmakers made temporary changes to the law, moving the deadline to 60 days so that those nominated conventions could still be held and the candidates could still make the ballot. This is the first time this has happened to only one party because the Republican convention will be held before the deadline, the Democratic convention will be held after it. And so now state lawmakers, according to Secretary of State Frank Burroughs, have to make a fix to this or the Democratic National Co Convention has to be moved, which seems very <laughs> unlikely because that's been in the plans for many, many months. It's set for late August in Chicago. And, and so it's, it's unlikely, of course, that that would be moved. There are some possibilities here that also include maybe a, a, a mini convention where candidates, I mean, we know who the candidates are gonna be, of course. We know President Biden will be the Democratic nominee. Can there be some sort of a mini convention held? Can there be some other things that are done? Uh, the, the real question is, will state lawmakers make this fix by early May when they have to for it to go forward as it is without some other fix involved? Yeah, and, and of course, as you mentioned, in previous iterations of this, both parties were had it, had it at stake. In this case, it's the party that's out of power that is going to be, uh, at least in the state of Ohio, the legislature is controlled by the Republicans. It's a Democratic candidate. So uh, this has all sorts of wonderful possibilities as things go forward. If they don't change the date, if the Democrats don't change their date, obviously some, somewhere in some court somewhere, whether it's the Ohio Supreme Court probably eventually the U.S. Supreme Court, maybe that's where we end up. I don't know, uh, you know, Dr. Hughes, talk about that a little bit because it's sort of like these elections anymore, there's always a yes but or what if or how did this happen sort of thing. So talk about that a little bit. So I don't love to make predictions because I'm often wrong when I try to forecast things, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose to be a little bit optimistic. I think the optics nationally for the state of Ohio, should the lawmakers choose to do nothing, would be so bad, um, particularly given the number of lawmakers that opposed Colorado's efforts to keep um, Trump off the ballot there and requiring the Supreme Court to actually weigh in and say, you can't, you can't do that. I think the optics of Ohio trying to keep a major party nominee off the ballot for the party that's not in power would be so bad. I would hope that they wouldn't do that. I think you'd end up with a, an uproar both within the state of Ohio and then nationally. Um, I'm going to also guess that this is not a mistake that the Democrats are gonna make again. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, it is in terms of, of convention scheduling, but the convention can't get moved because the logistics of moving an event that large, regardless of what, what it is, whether it's the Democratic National Convention or any other large event that involves that many people and that level of hotel room space, convention space events is just not practical. Um, but I don't know, my colleague, I, I see him looking at me, so he may have another <laughs> yeah, opinion yeah. <laughs> um, about my optimism. He, he may be a little more cynical than you are, maybe. <laughs> We're just in, and we could be wrong about that prediction too, but go ahead. <laughs> no, that was just courtesy, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> okay. I, I right. appreciate uh, my colleague uh, mm -hmm. hoping for that to happen uh, in Columbus as well. Um, okay. And I will uh, cautiously share her optimism if for no other reason than the fact that uh, each party does have, one would hope, a long-term interest in maintaining the uh, appearance of the credibility of elections in the absence of shenanigans. Yeah. Now, 
I, I will say too that the 90 day deadline issue was really interesting because it was buried in a law that set up the method of paying voter approved bonuses for Ohio veterans of the Persian Gulf, if Afghanistan and Iraq wars. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of buried in the middle of this. And a 90 day deadline pushes it all the way back to early August. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the conventions, that's really early. I mean, 2016, both the conventions were held in July and they were back to back. But a lot of times the conventions have been pushed out to August and September. So that 90 day deadline is really early for people who are planning these conventions to think about. And obviously, Ohio is just one of 50 states that they have to think about in terms of uh, ballot access. Yeah. Well, heck, I mean, this is a state that requires you to register to vote 30 days before the election when a state just north of us allows same day voter registration. So, um, you know, maybe it's time for Ohio to figure out if uh, the, the duration of time that's necessary for some of these things isn't set a little higher than it needs to be. Yeah. Now, w if you look at this too, uh, the state of Ohio, you know, as we talked about many times, for a long time was that bellwether, it was a predictor of who won, hasn't been the case most recently. Um, is there, and, and polling in Ohio, I mean, the assumption would be right now that Donald Trump would win Ohio. So it's, on one hand, you could look and say, well, Joe Biden's not gonna win Ohio anyhow, so it's not on the ballot, who cares? But then there's the all of the investment that makes somebody still campaign here, even if you, in the case of Donald Trump, still having to spend money in Ohio to be, to make sure that nothing happens in the opposite way. Well, and I think with, you know, that might be true at the presidential level, though mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that it is, yeah, but that yeah. essentially negates everything else that's down ballot ah, that relies okay. on people who show up to want to register their presidential preference mm -hmm. and then also vote for everything else that is there when they may not be as motivated to turn out for the all mm -hmm. of the other 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 elections that are going to yeah. be on there. And, and I think we saw a little bit of that and we were coming down at the end of the segment, a little bit of that maybe with the primary because both of the presidential nominees were locked in. Uh, that may have affected turnout. I don't know. We haven't seen a lot of information there, but uh, yeah, that would have. But, but I think, as you said, Dr. Hughes, that uh, a situation where Ohio says, oh, by the way, there's only one major candidate on our ballot. We'd, well, we'd get a lot of attention, that's for sure. We'd be in the news a lot, and maybe that's part of the game. I don't know. Um, when we come back, let's talk a little more about the primary, and we can kind of dig into what happened in some of the what would be like the U.S. Senate race, because obviously there were some things going on there that uh, that, that turned out the way certain people wanted, the way maybe other people didn't. And then the ninth congressional, where you've got the longest serving uh, female in the congressional history, uh, now facing a different district than she did two, two cycles ago. So uh, back in just a moment with Dr. David Jackson, Dr. Nicole Califf Hughes, and the host of the state of Ohio, Karen Kessler, here on The Journal. You're with us on The Journal. Our guests are Dr. David Jackson, Dr. Nicole Califf Hughes, and Karen Kessler, host of the State of Ohio, which you can see every Sunday at noon here on WBGU PBS. Shameless promotion there, but it's a good show, so make sure you watch it. Uh, when I came out of the last segment, I sort of dismissed the fact that Ohio was going to be competitive at the presidential level. Obviously, people would argue about that. Um, but beyond that point, there is more to that than just the presidential race, which makes Ohio an incredibly key state. And Dr. Jackson, talk about that, because there's more to it than just who wins Ohio at the presidential side. Well, yeah, if you, you look at the last few elections in Ohio uh, statewide, I mean, we had in 2016 Donald Trump with, you know, what, an eight-point win, uh, 2020 about the same. Uh, Tim Ryan lost by maybe seven or eight points. You can't really look at the governor's race uh, because mm -hmm. um, you had a very popular incumbent with a very underfunded, uh, under uh, known uh, challenger in that case. But the fact is that, you know, there is a significant amount of evidence that suggests that, you know, statewide, um, you know, Ohio ha has been leaning Republican. Um, and that being the case, uh, there, there's some evidence to suggest that it's not because the public is leaning Republican overall, but that the people who are actually registered to vote and who actually show up are. And that may sound like a, a putting too fine a point on it, but it's really not because, you know, there's the pool of all eligible voters, there's then the pool who are actually registered to vote, and then there's the pool who actually show, show up. up. And the ones who actually show up are the ones who decide elections. And so um, we, we can talk about ways in which Ohio may not be uh, as distinct from our neighbor to the north, Michigan, uh, on that question. But at the immediate question, um, in Ohio, of course, in 2024, there is a Senate election, and the cliche already has become, you know, that control of the Senate goes through Ohio, which you know, I think is, you know, probably accurate. So 
Um, that probably means that the Biden campaign, although they won't be focusing on Ohio, they'll be focusing on the states that they won last time that were in some cases unexpected, uh, uh, Arizona and Georgia. Uh, in other cases, the rebuilding of the blue wall, as it was called, until 2016 uh, through Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and probably not focusing a lot of money on changing uh, the Ohio outcome. They can't not participate in Ohio because they can't be too much of a drag on the Brown campaign. Campaign. Right. And so um, for that fact alone, uh, we can anticipate, you know, a great deal of money being spent, certainly by the Republican and Democratic senatorial campaigns. Uh, but the Biden campaign can't be non-existent because they can't be dragging Senator Brown's yeah. re-election They can't just leave down. him on an island someplace and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I asked Tim Ryan about what it's like not to be supported <laughs> by your yeah. national party. Yeah. And he came closer than, if because his argument always was, if I'd gotten a little more support, I might have, I maybe could have won, but then every candidate believes that too. Um, and then, of course, you too, now, the House races in Ohio probably not as, as competitive in a lot of cases, but we do have one uh, locally, the 9th Congressional District, Marcy Kaptur, been there for quite some time, uh, has fended off opponent after opponent after opponent all these years. Um, this year, uh, is this her most difficult opponent? It's, it's uh, uh, the guy who was a state representative from Monclova, Lucas County, uh, very well known compared to some of the other candidates. Um, is this going to be her toughest challenge, you think, for in quite some time? I think maybe. Um, I think we have to remember, too, that that district, the district that she's currently in now, mm -hmm. was drawn specifically to unseat her. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the reason that she was so successful last time was the challenger that she was running against. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think given the drawing of the current district, the fact that the Republicans have targeted her so much because she is a mm -hmm. Democratic um, member of the House, longest ser serving female member of the House. Um, I think that's part of the reason, right? The district was drawn mm -hmm. to unseat her. And her opponent is local, is popular, particularly popular um, on, on, on the right and farther to the right. And so mm -hmm. I think it will be challenging. That being said, I think it would be wrong to underestimate her and everything that she mm -hmm. has done for the district in her right. 42? Yeah, 42 years. years yeah. In, 42 yeah. years in Congress. And she is broadly popular with people on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. because she has delivered so much for the district and the various iterations of the district that we've had over time. I think it will, um, particularly in um, Toledo and the eastern parts of the district, it'll come down to who shows up. And so a lot of it has to do with voter mobilization, getting people registered, getting people to turn out. Um, because the numbers, I, I do think the numbers are there based on what we've roughly seen, that there hasn't been a ton of polling. Um, but again, it really just depends on who shows up on that day. Yeah. And, well, and to be clear, clear too, too yeah. I mean, uh, underestimate Marcy Kaptur at your own peril. Mm, I sure. mean, there's a, a history of that going back yeah. to, to 1982. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, um, it, it's true that uh, Representative Marin uh, represented, you know, a, a state house district and has name recognition uh, in a significant portion of the district. But we're, what now, seven months out from the election, and uh, there's going to be a huge amount of money uh, invested in this race uh, on both the Democratic and Republican side. And in terms of finding any surprises in Marcy Kaptur's past, yeah. the, the probability of that is zero. There's nobody <laughs> yeah, who's now. been vetted you know, better yeah. than a 42-year you know, yeah. incumbent. Yeah. On yeah. the other hand, uh, <laughs> while somewhat well-known, Derek Maron you know, hasn't faced this level, level of scrutiny, scrutiny, hasn't faced mm -hmm. this level of ferocity, uh, hasn't faced this level of spending. Um, we, we saw the ugliness that happened in the Senate campaign statewide. Sure. Um, yeah. Every, we, we saw ugliness in some state house races. Uh, yeah. um, it, it, one prediction I think it's fairly safe to make is that, that this election is probably going to be the I don't mean the, just the 9th Congressional District, I mean the election overall is going to be one of the most vicious, ugly, mean-spirited, nasty, personal, bitter, rotten elections we've ever had. Well, I'm feeling um, good about this yeah, now. Yeah, there's the optimism. <laughs> yeah. uh, no. Which then can hurt turnout because that yeah. turns off a lot people of people. Are, yeah, so at the like same just, time, yeah. you've got to have campaigns who balance the, the amount of attack ads that are effective because attack ads work, but can also have the secondary effect of, of decreasing turnout and increasing synergy. Criticism. So um, in close elections, uh, candidates are going to have to, and the, the other organizations supporting them, you know, walk a, walk a line to try to uh, 
balance out you know the positive and the negative yeah now when we come back as with the end of the segment um karen when i come back i'd like to ask you about derek Marin's role in columbus and whether that is a positive for him or a negative because there was a lot of bad publicity that came out of that whole infighting with the republican party and of course he facing off against jason stevens and them funding competing candidates and the blue 22 and and all of that so when we come back let's talk about uh Marin's profile right now, probably good with some people, maybe not so good with other Republicans, and whether that would have any impact in the 9th Congressional District. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment here on The Journal. Thanks for staying with us on The Journal. We're talking uh, post-primary analysis, but also looking ahead now to the November election. Um, in that last segment, Karen, we were talking about the 9th Congressional District. Um, obviously, Derek Marin is the Republican nominee now. Um, He's got a lot of name recognition, but is all of that name recognition good among the Republicans that are out there or not? Because there's been a lot of infighting in Columbus between him and Jason Stevens and Matt, Matt Huffman citing basically with Derek Maron. But uh, is, that, is that a potential problem for him that some Republicans might not come home to him because of what they would see as shenanigans in Columbus? Well, certainly there's the argument that all publicity is good publicity, but uh, in this case, Derek Maron became better known, I guess, because he was indeed the Republican House Caucus choice for speaker in late 2022. But then when the floor vote happened in early 2023, Jason Stevens had brought together all 32 of Ohio's House Democrats, as well as 22 Republicans, and he ended up beating Derek Maron. Maron still calls himself the leader of the Republican caucus among House members hmm. and has still maintained that he is in charge of the Republican caucus because he got the most Republican votes. Of course, there was a battle over who controls the money from the Ohio House Republican caucus campaign account, and Maron's folks lost that at least temporarily. But uh, I think what really is important here when, com when it comes to the actual vote is if as we said earlier in the show, if for some reason President Biden is not on the ballot, that could really affect other issues mm. and other uh, other races down ticket. And I think Marcy Kaptur's race could be one of those big ones because if, if Biden isn't there to bring out Democratic voters, that could really have an impact on turnout in the 9th Congressional District and potentially in other districts where it is close. I mean, the districts were drawn so that there would be 13 Republicans and two Democrats, essentially. That's the way that uh, it appeared that the <laughs> Ohio Redistricting Commission maps would go. And indeed, five Democrats and 10 Republicans won. So there's going to be a battle for some of those seats. Yeah, and, and we've talked about the Senate being up for grabs, but there, of course, there's, and there's a discussion too that the House will be, because it's, it's relatively narrow now, well, very narrow now. Uh, so yeah, every House race is probably just as important maybe as, as some of the Senate races. Um, when you, you rotate that through, so Ohio, even though there's, you can debate whether or not the presidential race is going to be as close or will be close, it's all of those down ballot things. And so that, that we go back to the very first thing we talked about. What if Joe Biden, for some reason, despite the bad optics for Ohio, they go, no, you got to file the 90 day mark. And if you haven't, guess what? You're not on the ballot. Yeah, there's no way you could write in for president and get any kind of balloting. I don't know how that works in Ohio, but I would think that would be your only alternative then would be to run as a, if you can run as a write in candidate for president in Ohio. I don't know if you even can, but it does, it does beg the issue depending on, because we've seen this legislature take some interesting stands sometimes. Would this be one they'd want to want to take? I don't know. I don't know. Um, when you look at the Senate race, obviously Bernie Marino, Trump endorsement, I hear from you read various things that that's the candidate that Sherrod Brown wanted to run against of the three that were there because the other two have much better name recognition. Is that for either you, either one of you, is, one, is that going to be an issue? Is that a, is that a big advantage that maybe Bernard Marino isn't as well known as the other two? Well, yeah, I mean, you hear these things about, you know, the uh, Brown campaign um, uh, wanting Bernie uh, to Moreno to get the nomination. And you hear rumors about having spent money uh, to cause that to happen. 
Um, these are the sorts of things that happen in politics. So there's nothing really, you know, shocking or surprising about that, 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 that campaigns make a series of strategic choices uh, from beginning to end, uh, that, that they use a, an imperfect uh, amount of information available to make their best guess <laughs> about how things are gonna work out and, and what's gonna happen, you know, uh, from, from those choices. The one thing I would caution about that is that um, there is um, you know, some data, you know, and some of the data is pretty dramatic in terms of the outcome that shows you have to be careful what you wish for on one party side, uh, hoping for a victory from the other party side. And we can go back to the 1960s in California when Governor Pat Brown, a uh, Democratic incumbent, uh, I understand, uh, was pretty excited about this uh, Hollywood actor uh, getting the Republican Party's nomination for governor. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they thought, well, that's, we're on easy street now. Yeah. Turned <laughs> and, out uh, to be somebody who was pretty good at that particular uh, job. It, yeah. And uh, among, you know, well, we all know, you know what history yeah. showed after that. So yeah. I guess you got to be careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're right, they make strategic decisions. But they have to make the yeah. choices they make. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it's like, um, when the election is over, it's like watching poker on television because you can see everybody's hand. Mm -hmm. The players at the table can't see everybody's hand mm -hmm. during the game. So they're playing with imperfect information and an absence of information. And so they make a series of choices that are right or wrong based on the information they have, not perfect information. Now, now going back to something you mentioned earlier too, is it possible too that the Brown campaign believes there might be some things that they could use in Bernie Marino's previous background, his whatever, his work things, that sort of thing, that whereas the other two guys have been vetted, as you said, sometimes, you know, Marcy Captor, there's nothing you're gonna find on her after 42 years, they'd have found it by now. Uh, is that maybe part of it too, that Marino's an outsider, he's gonna run as, I'm an outsider, I'm a businessman, he hasn't been through the, sort of like the grinder that maybe the other two guys have been? Well, the plus side of running an outsider is that they're an outsider, and it all depends on what the electorate's mood is, because in 2016, and again, political science is not in, in love with the concept of talking about the overall mood of the electorate sure. without the data to back it up, but the, the common understanding of the 2016 election was that the electorate was in a mood for change. The Democrats nominated a candidate who was not a candidate of change, except for the fact that she would have been the first woman elected president in history. Um, but they went for the outsider, you know, in 2016. So what's happening in 2024 in Ohio? Is it going to be an electorate whose mood is one for the outsider? Well, then that can help the outsider. On the other hand, the downside of running an outsider uh, used to be uh, before Trump descended the escalator and. 2015 was that they weren't vetted and they had terrible things sometimes in their past that could be discovered and used against them and that would, would crush a, a candidate. Yeah. Um, I very famously incorrectly predicted after um, the John McCain comments that Donald Trump made way back when that this would probably be the end of his campaign because the American electorate's not going to accept you know such a yeah. nasty set of comments about a, a war hero. So, uh, you know, yes, the fact of the matter is uh, an outsider hasn't been vetted. They're going to find out things that they can use against them. But who knows anymore? <laughs> yeah, whether it matters or not at that things. point. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I can remember we used to sit and when we were doing the show back in 2015 and 16 that almost weekly where we did the show that, well, isn't, wouldn't that be well, the end of a campaign? It, right? yeah. Surely this yeah. is the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this has to be it, right? I think and the Access Hollywood yeah. tape yeah. should be the thing that's disabused of, of the notion that one terrible thing can undo yeah. a candidate. undo now. a campaign, but, but, but back in the day, that was the case. Um, shifting back a little bit uh, to Derek Maron, the blue 22, as we look forward to the legislature between now and the end of the year, obviously some of, uh, Jason Stevens supporters were stripped away or will, will be out of office at the end of this year. How does that affect what the legislature is gonna do? Is it really gonna, is it gonna ramp up the problems among the Republicans or will they just kind of go, okay, we give, we're gonna move on and all be happy together? Or I mean, what's, what's the feel down there? Or is it gonna be just the way it's been for the last year and a half? Well, I will say on the uh, Sherrod Brown, Bernie Marino race, mm -hmm. the Ohio Democratic Party and Sherrod Brown's folks are really pushing some of their concerns and their claims about Bernie Marino. They're, they're a lot more aggressive than they were in the 2022 race between J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan. So I think that that really indicates that they were ready for Bernie Marino to be the nominee and that they have their attack plan in place. On then switching over to the uh, House Speaker situation. You mentioned earlier that uh, 
Senate President Matt Huffman is involved in this. And it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely the case because Derek Maron was term limited in the House and Senate President Matt Huffman wants to come back over to the House. He and Jason Stevens, the current speaker, are both running unopposed for the House this fall. So they're going to be facing one another <laughs> potentially for the House speakership. And Huffman has made more comments that it was a terribly poorly hidden secret that he wanted to be speaker, but now he's starting to make more comments about this. And with the loss of four Republicans who had supported Stevens for speaker, four of the so-called Blue 22, that kind of opens the door for Huffman potentially to win the speaker race. Okay. We don't know until we know, and certainly Derek Merrick can back this up because he thought he had the votes before the floor vote and then he didn't. So it certainly makes though the race for speaker in January potentially really, really interesting. Okay, well, we'll we'll pick it up in downstream a little bit because we're, we're out of time now. But yeah, it's, there's a lot going on in Ohio, even though sometimes we think there's not a lot going on in Ohio when it comes to politics. Uh, thank you all for being here again. You can check us out at WBGU.org. You can watch us every Thursday night at 8 p.m. on WBGU PBS. We will see you again next time. Good night and good luck.